try some goddamn chess. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the actual new wave bands, and we're gonna start with the American pioneers of the 1970s. These pioneer sections definitely Shit. lead into the 1980s, but the groups in these sections had a lot of importance in the 1970s. So we're gonna start with the band Devo, who is uh, interesting. They're, They're one, one of the groups, groups in this video, video that have explicitly stated their love for Roxy music and Brian Eno had actually produced their first album. When they got their start, they were really interested in making, like, the sound of the future and had a very, like, geeky, synth-heavy image. They were really experimental starting out and would frequently, like, mess with their audience by doing stupid antics. One of my favorites is that early on they couldn't get gigs, so they would just, like, pretend to be a cover band. They would get on stage and be like, here's another one by Fog Hat, and then start playing their own stuff. They rejected punk sustain for the, the mainstream were also, also cynical of the rock, rock elitism at the, at the time, time which led, led to their, their futuristic sound. sound. They're, They're actually, actually a really political, political band and touch on all sorts of abstract topics, but most, most people only know them as that 180s group with the funny hats. hats. Their, their first, first album is what I think the best entryway way to get into their music. However, their, their most popular was their third album, Freedom of Choice, that came out in 1980 that featured their biggest hit, Whip It. There's something, There's something to be said about Devo that you can actually say about a lot of the artists, artists in this, this video. video. You'll probably, You'll probably notice, notice this as we get along, along, but a lot, a lot of the music in New, New Wave, Wave is, is very, very prominent, prominent in, in pop culture and in pop music. music. And, a and a lot of these, of these groups, groups are written off as like goofy, goofy one-hit one -hit wonders, and a lot of their music has been played to death on the radio or in fucking hotel commercials, but below the very surface level understanding we have of them, they have very fucking roots into our culture as a whole. A lot of these artists' lesser-known works have gone on to influence a lot of different from artists, artists that came, that came after, after them. them. The other, the other really, really notable, notable pioneers, pioneers for New Wave, wave out, out of America came out of the CBGB scene and played, played along artists, artists like, like the Ramones and Patti Smith. Move, you slit that slut from China! In 1974 and were regulars at the famous CBGB before they became two of the biggest bands in the world. Starting with Talking Heads, they were one of the most critically acclaimed bands of all time. You oiled the prostitutes! They were that came after them. They were one of those artists that really walked the line between New Wave and Post Punk and show just how blurry that line is. Simon Reynolds in his book Rip It Up and Start Again goes on to explain what puts them more into the new way though with quote in the early days talking head skinny sound seemed to slot right into the skinny time mold of new wave bands like XTC and the Cars. The new wave template consisted of choppy rhythm guitar with hardly any lead playing, fast ungroovy tempos and often keyboards. The vocals tended to be high pitched, geeky and very white. The songs, the songs often had stop-start stop structures and melodies that, that were angular and, and jumpy rather than, than gently curving. curving. This, this would be a... Sp Star structures and melodies that were angular and jumpy rather than gently curving. This would be especially true on their debut, but on their next three albums, which were all produced by Brian Eno, yes, there's Eno again, they expanded their sound and really came into their own. They would take heavy influence from funk music and put a new wave flair on it. Remain in Light, released in 1980, would be the last in this trilogy and saw the band exploring Afrobeat and African rhythms inspired by Fela Kuti. Many consider this to be their defining work and would spawn one of their most and songs once in a lifetime, which has one of the best music videos of all time. You, you suck my dick, bitch. 1983 would see them hit the peak of their career, though, when they released their album Speaking in Tongues, which had their only top 10 hit in the States, Burning Down the House. You suck, you suck, not making sense a year later, which features David Byrne in his iconic big suit, dancing and running full speed around the stage. A24 picked up the rights to the film and released it in 4K in 2023, but there's a special edition DVD coming out this year for its 40th anniversary if you want to check that out. Talking Heads made a name for themselves in the CBGB scene, but they would come up alongside another group that would blow them out of the water in the mainstream. Blondie. Blondie. Blondie is a group that started out pretty rough around the edges and would make a name for themselves more in the UK than in the US first when they became a Now fuck up and take that! Short tangent because I don't think I've discussed it on the channel yet, but for my 
Now fuck him! Now fuck up and take that bitch! Was a weekly TV show that was no, supposed to a lot of the biggest acts at the time. And artists Twist. would perform one of their tracks live for audiences at home. And I put that in quotations because Top of the Pops insisted that artists would mine and lip sync along to their songs, which a lot of artists had a problem with, but. It was, it was just part of the show. show. Top, Top of the Pops would play a major role in the glam scene, scene with David Bowie's and T-Rex's early 1970s performances being incredibly influential to young people in the UK. Basically, if you could get on Top of the Pops, you were in the big time, and it was a chance for you to get even bigger. So it was a big deal that Blondie were mainstays on that show. However, their album in 1978, Parallel Lines, would make them a household name in America. Parallel Lines would cement Blondie as the most successful band to come out of the New York CBGB scene when it went to the top 10 on Billboard. It showed the world that those out of the punk scene could compete in the world of pop. The disco-infused single Heart of Glass off the album would hit number one on Billboard and would also be their first number one hit in the UK. This album would kick off Blondie to be one of the most successful bands of all time. Their ability to fuse genres really put them above everyone else, and they were not afraid of going disco. In fact, they would work with the father of disco, Giorgio Moroder, to write their hit single, Call Me, for the film American Gigolo. God would be the number one single of 1980, which really shows how important Blondie is to pop music. They quite literally kicked off in the 1980s. God fucking damn it. It was in 1980 and they would actually pick off in the 1980s. Which pick. She's the smell of Shelly Christian. Wow. And that's not even the middle of the 1980s. Right there, hit afraid of going disco. With the film Mary Blondie Man. Call Me the number one single of 1980. Their ability to. This album would kick off Blondie. No, 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 God, fuck it. Their peak was in 1980, and they would actually end up breaking up in 1982, but their legacy is undeniable, and they also got back together in the late 90s. Debbie Harry, in particular, is an iconic figure, and when people bring up prolific women in rock music, she's usually one of the first to get brought up. Gwen Stefani and Miley Cyrus are two people in particular who have taken a clear influence from her. I'm also realizing we're probably going to have to move through this a little bit quicker. We're going to be here like all day. <laughs> A lot of America Fuck were it. groups like the B-52s and the Cars, and the B-52s we're going to talk about more towards like the end of the video, but the Cars were massively popular. The Cars self-titled debut in 1978 is often considered one of the best rock albums of all time. The album features the stripped-down sound of punk, but infused with more pop and even some electronic elements. They were much like Blondie in that they have quite a few top 40 hits under their belt. I see a dick in your future. I see a dick. Elvis Costello is an odd figure in that he wasn't really that tied to punk rock, but does owe his popularity to the movement. He's a really nerdy guy who took more influence from like the Beatles and the original Elvis, but had a lot more angst behind him. He'd been playing for a while before he got big because now he was able to share an audience with those in the punk movement. His album Armed Forces and would break into the top 10, but it was the album before this year's model released in 1978 that would spawn one of his most Iconic God songs damn it. radio. Radio Radio is a God critique of the commercialization of radio at the time, and so it resonated God with a lot of young it. people. This, this album would also be his first to feature his new back God band, The Attraction. God, Costello fuck early it. on was a really rebellious figure, and I think that's why God, Cars really took a liking to him in the 1970s. One of his most well-known moments was in 1977 when he went on SNL and went against the script to play his song Radio Radio, which was not on the set list. This would actually get him banned from SNL until the late 1980s. Suck my dick, bitch. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, there's no reason to do this song here.
Another British group that would inspire a lot of 1980s new wave artists, and actually a lot of bands in the 90s, was XTC. XTC were certainly more popular in the UK than they were in America, but they carved a name for themselves as some of the best songwriters of the time. They didn't really take to the punk movement at the time, as they took far more influence from groups like the Beatles and the Beach Boys, so they were way more interested in pop music. Their songs featured the raw sound of punk rock with some quirkier studio choices, but everything always boiled down to a pop sensibility. They would gain some popularity on their first, more like post-punk albums, but their third album, Drums and Wires, Come on, you slut! Showed them a Come on, you slut! They would become known for. This would be a far more accessible album from the group and would get them their first top 40 hit in the UK with Making Plans for Night. About overbearing parents planning their child's future in British steel. XTC would continue to have a lot of success in the 1980s and never stop experimenting. And honestly, when I think of British New Wave in the 1970s, XTC is like the suck my dick bitch. Around the same time as XTC, there was another pioneer who was paving the way for New Wave, but in a much more glamorous style. Adam Ant got, got his start with Adam and the Ants and, and was originally managed by Malcolm McLaren before Malcolm stole the members from his band to form Bow Wow Wow. wow. His, his first album with the Ants, which was Dirk Ware's White, White Sox, released in 1979, was far more post-punk in sound and aesthetic, but Adam and <laughs> stole the members bitch. of his band. Adam dove headfirst into pop, which was what he wanted to do all along. Adam Ant, whose real name is Stuart Goddard, got most of his influence from the punk movement and the glam groups of the 1970s. One of his biggest contributions to New Wave and the bands he inspired was his looks. His getup had pieces from pirates, Native Americans, and the British military. He would really break out onto the scene in the UK when he released his album Kings of the Wild Frontier in 1980 and Prince Charming in 1980. Ah! Both released with the new members of the Ants. These albums would make Adam and a teenage heartthrob and blow him up to superstar status. And these would be the albums where he really refined his sound. They took heavily from glam rock but introduced tribal rhythms that match Adam's vision. And, and they were, of course, course dressed, dressed up in true pop fashion. Get that whore out of here! He would continue to have success in the UK, but it wasn't until he dropped his band and went solo as Adam Ant that he got his success in the US. His album, Friend or Foe, released in 1982, was his biggest yet and featured his first hit single in the US, Goody Two Shoes, which was part of a Get that work out of you, slut! A movement made up of British artists invading American television. These pioneers in the 1970s showed what really defined New Wave. They had a strong connection to punk rock, whether that be through their origin, their influences, or their attitude. The only difference is that they all had a desire to make it in the pop world and didn't care about the limitations set by punk's code of honor. They had their own way of doing things, and that would prove to be what allowed them to take over the radio. So the UK was a really important Suck my dick! However, I'm American, which means that everything is about me. And, and that's, that's why I decided to split up the timeline with half of it happening before 1981 and half happening after. There were other important events happening in 1981, but this year would be when the music industry changed forever. This was when MTV officially launched. Don't even think about it! MTV transformed how artists interacted with their audiences and would shape American culture all throughout the 1980s. It certainly owes its success to artists like Michael Jackson. Prince and Madonna, but it, but it was, was the British, British New Wave fans that gave the channel its identity in the beginning. This, this is really showcased by the fact that the first music video, video played on MTV was a New Wave song by a New Wave band. band. Video, video Killed, killed the, the Radio Star by British group The Buggles was released in 1979 but got the honor of being the first music video on MTV in 1981. Members, members from this group like Trevor Horn would go on to do other big things in the new wave genre but they would ultimately kickstart the revolution of music television in America. Suck my dick! Suck my dick! Suck my slut! MTV also helped usher in something in America that was coined the second British invasion. Well, it's technically the third if you count, you know. 
The, the first British, British invasion was in the 1960s when groups like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the Kings were getting really in America. The second, the second British, British invasion refers to when a lot of British acts were getting really big in America in the early 1980s, with its peak happening around like 1983. British artists would dominate the American charts with a particular week in July of 1983 being made up of majority British acts on the Billboard Top 10. A lot of the biggest acts at the time either came from God or were inspired it. by a specific underground movement that was happening in Britain around God the year 1980. This is the story of the New Romantics. The New Romantic movement was a subculture that came out of London and consisted of artists, musicians, and regulars of the Blitz nightclub. The culture was known mostly for its androgynous fashion and combined the flashiest parts of glam with an affinity for 19th century British clothing. The scene had a strong LGBTQ presence and this played heavily into the identity of of the movement. Not, Not everyone out of the movement identified under that umbrella. God, However, it was thanks it. to that community that we have a lot of the fashion. Come on, you slut that slut. The Blitz nightclub, where most of this was coming out of, opened in 1979 and was a hub for the new romantics. The regulars of this club worshipped artists like David Bowie, with his album Heroes in particular being a favorite. Blitz was pretty short lived as it closed in 1981. However, a lot of the artists that came out of the Slut, I'm fixing to dick up that roof, slut. The New Romantics were important because they were the innovators that inspired much of the fashion and music that a lot of 80s New Wave was known for. Go ahead and take that. One of the contributions to come out of this scene was put You're together gonna lose that damn the Blitz as the group Visage. Their track Fade to Grey in 1980 never made a splash in the US but did well in Europe and had a potential of the scene. Now fuck up and move that roof right here. The group that was really first to make big waves out of the new romantic scene, though, was Spandau Ballet. They combined the synth sound of the future with synopsis vocals, but definitely had a need to redefine pop music. They had a really heavy presence at the first to put a musical formula to the eccentric fashion. Their debut single was To Cut a Long Story Short, which captivated Britain in 1980, but they wouldn't score a hit in the U.S. until 1983 with their song True, which actually went into the top 40 on Billboard. Those of you out there who work retail can't get enough of this one, I'm sure. The next two groups that we're going to talk about were arguably two of the defining bands on MTV, and they both came out of the new romantic scene. And the first one we're going to talk about was actually Princess Diana's favorite band. Duran Duran was Blitz Kids, but were part of an adjacent movement in Birmingham. They were also the first to acknowledge the term new romantic in lyrics for the song. Come on, you slut that whore! Which on top of the song would go to number 12 on the UK charts in 1981. Duran were a group that were directly inspired by artists like Roxy Music, the punk rock genre, and also disco groups like Chic. They would very quickly become hard rock in the UK before turning their attention to America and would find tremendous success with their second album, Rio. Rio, which was released in 1982, found I'm fixing to give myself another whore! and would score them multiple top 40 hits in the US. The album would garner praise from artists like Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson and showed the band arriving as pop sensation. Duran Duran would continue to be incredibly successful throughout the 1980s. They were featured heavily on MTV and were part of that second British invasion. And as much as I don't even think about it, think of when I hear Hungry Like the Wolf is that scene in Big Fat Liar where they turn Paul Giamatti blue, which I'm sure was the intended purpose of that song the entire time. The third group that I want to talk about from the new Roman. Stupid! Start around the time that the Blitz nightclub ah! Culture Club was formed in 1981 with singer Boy George, who was a regular. You are not gonna get the group had a tremendous amount of success in the early 1980s thanks to their soulful new wave sound. Right from their debut album Kissing to Be Clever in 1982, they had ah! success when their single Do You Really Want to Hurt Me blew up in both the UK and the US. Don't even think about it, slut.
Many of Culture Club's biggest songs are about the intimate relationship between oh! Boy George and their drummer John Moss. I think that aspect lends to their song a lot of emotional depth and is one of the reasons behind their Their second album, Color by Numbers, released in 1983, would be their biggest yet and feature all the top 40 hits with Karma Chameleon being the only number one hit in the U.S. and their second number one hit in the U.S. Moose, what? Culture Club and Boy George are probably Move, the best example of the new romantic Shit. movement being exposed Shit. to an American audience. They would be featured heavily on MTV, and when I surveyed 80s historians, my mom, who were around during their heyday, she remembers them being a staple on the channel. By the time some of these other groups got to America, they had kind of toned down some of their fashion and more flamboyant aspects. But Boy George stepped out repping the Blitz kids right from the start, and this led to a lot of people emulating him and getting a taste of this underground movement from across the pond. Culture Club are definitely one of the groups that I think of when I think of 80s New Wave. So around, so around this time, there were a few groups that now fuck up and move that on, on and who were showing a lot of potential at the turn of the decade. Shut up, going slow. forward, there's, there's going to be a lot of labels thrown around that all pretty much refer to the same thing. New wave, new music, synth pop, and in particular, new pop was a term that was being thrown around in critic circles at the beginning of the 1980s. You have to think, at this time, music trends were just moving super quickly. And the year 1980 was the beginning of an exciting new decade with a lot of new technology and potential rolling in from the 1970s. So new pop was an indication of where things were headed. This term, new pop, was really used to describe a new movement in the 1980s where groups had a desire to bring a punk sensibility to pop music and reshape the mainstream. Paul Morley, a British music journalist, really championed this new movement, and from everything God I can find, the origin of the term new pop traces all the way back to him in a specific piece he wrote in NME in December of 1980. This article highlights three bands that Morley felt were the next big thing going into the God 1980s. Damn it. Okay, so here's the thing. This article was really important in the scope of music journalism and also in me researching this video. I looked everywhere for this thing online and just could not find it. So I actually went out and found the original paper for when this thing came out. This is the year in 1980 issue of NME featuring that article and I was able to pull from it directly. But there's a catch. The three artists that I thought he wrote about are not the ones that he wrote about. The three bands in the article are Essential Bob, Restricted Code, and ABC. The problem is Essential Bob and Restricted Code didn't go on to do pretty much anything. But ABC did. And there are two other artists that are mentioned in this article that we are going to talk about because they were just as hyped as the other groups. The Human League and Orange Juice. Let's start with the Human League. The Human League formed in 1977 and dropped their debut album in 1979 with frontman Philip Oki and had a clear desire to make futuristic music. Already from their first couple of singles, they were starting to get co-signed by bigger artists with David Bowie saying they were going to be the future of pop music. Their synth-pop styling sounded like the 1980s when they were still firmly at the tail end of the 1970s and they made a name for themselves in clubs around Europe playing shows with the likes of Iggy Pop and Susie and the Banshees. Not at the same time though, could you imagine? They didn't have a ton Come of on! success Come until on, they released their album Dare in 1981. Dare showed a true arrival for synth pop in the 1980s. With their two new members, Joanne Cathrall and Susan Ann Sully, they went all on making a pop record. They'd taken a lot of influence from Gary Newman, but the chemistry they had with their new members allowed them to create a synth pop classic. This album would blow them up in the UK and US and feature the first Billboard number one, a song that would get extensive play on early MTV and 2000s era Swiffer commercials. Don't you want me? actually did show up in the Morley article, though, was ABC. The band ABC, fronted by Martin Fry, was touted as one of the next big pop groups by critics. They were quintessential new pop in that they wanted to reshape the radio and be one of the biggest acts in the world. Right off the bat, they wanted to make music that was far more polished and grandiose than other pop music that was coming out at the time. This is another group that was really inspired by the new romantics, and sonically you can make a lot of comparisons to Spandau Ballet. Their crowning achievement was their debut album, The Lexicon of Love, which was a smash hit in the UK. 
It blended the sounds of disco and Frank Sinatra, but with a huge modern twist and featured songs like Tears Are Not Enough and Poison Arrow. The album has beautiful production thanks to Trevor Horn. Horn is one of the members from the Buggles I was talking about earlier that would do big things in the new wave scene. This album is one of my personal favorites from researching this video and has aged like a fine wine. Oh, I love that damn song! Oh, I love that. Damn, legacy so. is that they showed a lot of the ambition Damn, so. a lot of the artists in this era were known for. You can tell just from the music that they were not afraid to go big or go home. And hey, Paul Morley got one out of three right. I'd say that counts for something. The last band in the new pop realm that we're going to talk about. The last band that we're going to talk about in the new pop realm is the one that came out of what people call the Postcard Games. Postcard Games is a super small label that was out of Glasgow, Scotland that published mostly Scottish artists. Groups like that. Joseph A, Azzy and Orange Juice. There were a lot of eyes on Orange Juice early in their career, which would have been the late 1970s. They were far less electronic in their approach and took more influence from the Buzzcocks, the CBGB bands, and Chic. Their sound is closer to what people refer to as jangle pop, which is the same umbrella that a band and like this the ear, you're right. They didn't really have the same right that like the Human League or ABC had. However, I think I enjoy their music the most out of the three bands. Mind you, this second that that album, Rip It Up, came out in 1982, was far more ambitious than their debut, China? heavily with funk and disco rhythms. The title track was their only top ten hit in the UK, but it least gave them a drop of the success they had set out for. Okay, so we haven't really touched on Okay, so we haven't Okay, so we haven't really touched on this yet, but many of these artists influences and formula came from black genres. And there aren't exactly Come on, you slut years in new wave. Much, Much of the music, music that we're talking about in this video and in this series as a whole would have been possible see a dick in your future. I see a dick innovating in the first place. I, I see a dick in your future. I see a dick best with quote. The best I see a dick in your future. I see it. African American innovations in rhythm, production, and arrangement. I'm taking that ear. You're right. Michael Jackson slash Quincy Jones sound. The New York electro. I got enough. You're right here. The eighties had been assimilated by perennially. Mark Chris and then exported back to white America. That's why the American press heralded the 1980s British music as the second British invasion, a repeat of what happened in the 60s when the Stones, the Kings, sold their version of rhythm and blues to white American teenagers. Someone I want to highlight who did make a name for themselves but would actually go on to expand into the greater pop sphere in the 1980s is Grace Jones. Grace Jones is one of the most unique figures in music history, and her work has gone on to influence artists like Beyonce in the modern age. She got her start as a model before I just aired! I just aired! She started off making disco records in the 1970s. Artists like Beyonce in the modern age. She got her start as a model before becoming a staple in the disco scene at Studio 54. She started off making disco records in the 1970s before going into a more new wave direction in the 1980s. I think she was the best especially of somebody from the disco scene fully embracing new wave music. Her critically successful 1981 album Nightclubbing showed a lot of the versatility that new wave was known for. Come on, let's swap horns! The title track is from a cover of a Let's swap horns! Idiot. It also features this song, Demolition Man, that was written Let's by Steve from new wave band The Police for Let's Grace Jones. The album, thanks to Jamaican rhythm duo Sly and uses elements of reggae, dub, and disco and is a perfect example of the new wave sound emanating from a black artist. Damn, I'm fucking this guy's butt. Chris Jones would go on to do a lot of things outside of New Wave, but really embodied the genre at the Let's beginning see. of... Spit, 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 spit. Jim Little Extra Tree. 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 Man, she's gonna spit. Spit, spit. Yes. spit. 
but today we're going to talk about what is kind of pop music's response. Come on, let's swap horse. Let's swap horse. Okay, we'll swap horse. was getting very popular. Ah! Uh, so while punk and heavy metal exploded in the 70s, pop music had to retaliate. They had to come up with something fresh and new to counteract the energy and the excitement that was surrounding the heavier styles of music. God damn it. And that response is known as New Wave. The actual term New God. Wave started with critics who needed a term to describe new bands that came onto the scene that weren't quite playing punk or metal, but were still harnessing that irreverence of those genres. As a lot of these genres around us. With reverence of those genres. Emily. Hey, she smell like spit. Hey, Bella here. Today we are going to explore a new wave. With spit. New wave refers to the pop oriented styles from the late 1970s and the 80s. Late the 1970s is a fucking awesome bitch. You stupid fucker. Play the goddamn video, you slut. You bald ass slut. Welcome to my church, I'm Brandon. Today's Thursday episode will obviously not be part of the secular Bible study series that I do. Come on, you slut that whore from China. China. Testament. But I did have a little bit of time on my hands, and I have been seeing it everywhere this mischaracterization of an interview that Rich Come on, you on LBC, slut. where he talks about being a cultural Christian. I'm getting comments on my videos saying, don't you know Richard Dawkins is now a Christian? If your atheist what? leader is a Christian, what does that leave you with? Which is ridiculous for many reasons. But also the amount of videos that Christian and apologetic channels are making about this, and they're all, or I should say the ones that I have watched, are misrepresenting this, and it will seem purposefully. I don't know Richard Dawkins, I don't speak for Richard Dawkins, but I did want to clarify at least what I heard in the interview, and try to frame this a little bit better for people to understand. First thing I'll say is, this seems to be something that's brought up a lot. Well, Richard Dawkins thinks this, well, Richard Dawkins said that, we're not a club. We're not a religion. Richard Dawkins is not our leader. He's not the Pope. He's not speaking a general truth that then falls down. But Richard Dawkins converted to Christianity. We will shake your dog house down. He's not a lot for the atheist movement, if you can even call it that. But I think it's always important to understand that just like all Christians are individuals, all atheists are individuals. But the difference is, we don't hold to one holy book or one text. I don't read the God Delusion or the Selfish Gene chapter. Don't even think about it, you slut! My kids for them to orient their lives around. The common thread between atheists is we simply don't believe in God. That's it. It stops there. There's so many differences even within that. You have atheists that don't believe in evolution, and some that do. You have atheists that believe in God, and atheists that don't. You have atheists that are staunch and say they can't be. That's why those other atheists that are more agnostic, just atheistic toward a particular god, god that would be like me i don't believe in all or allah but i'm dumb open ass to the idea of there being something uh, uh, otherwise already know dumb ass. there's atheists that believe in objective morality and atheists that don't it's all over the board because we don't pretend to be some kind of an organization we're linked very dumb ass by a lack of belief end Stupid of story but let's talk about what richard dawkins said and what is being said I just about him. the first claim is this I just shit richard dawkins is now a christian and this one it's out I just there shit again watch pants. these videos yourselves it's absolutely ridiculous let alone how many clickbaity titles are out there saying this or the I just comments shit that i'm getting and i'm sure other atheists are as well he's not a christian he does not believe this. Let's play the clip and then talk about it. And what would be Man, your shit in my pants again? Well, I must say I was slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead. I do think that we we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. So, you know, I, I love him. I just shit in my pants again. I sort of feel at home in the Christian, the Christian ethos. I feel that we are... A Christian country in that sense. It's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down and I, I am happy with that. But I would not be happy if, um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our 
beautiful parish churches. Certainly, if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be tr truly dreadful. So, I might have chosen different words when answering that same question, but he's very specific to say he does not believe there is a difference yeah, really between a fucking pin Christian bitch. and a cultural Christian. And he even God, explains why he considers himself a cultural Christian. God, that he enjoys the hymns and the holidays and things like this, that he feels at home. And I'll speak for myself at this point, but growing up Christian for 30 years, God, I have it. a lot of good memories associated with Christmas or Easter. God, there are parts it. of church that were not wholly terrible God, and even it. beneficial or, dare I say, nostalgic. For any of you that watched me when I did my deconstruction of a Christian song for my youth, you probably saw that on display. Did that mean I all of a sudden believed in the truth claims about Jesus Christ? Of course not. Here, what I'm seeing well, from someone that I honestly haven't seen it that much from, Richard Dawkins, Wow, the, the nuance, nuance, the nuance that many Christians say they would like to see an atheist, that we can still understand that there are some good things, that we can still participate in the holy days as part of understanding that the predominant grouping still believes in these things. And if they want to sing hymns at Christmas time, and that's what comes on the radio, I'm not going to be the kind of atheist who says that stupid this God doesn't exist. I'm going to let it play. In the same way that when a song comes on about old Saint Nick, I don't say, well, I don't believe in Santa, so this is stupid. I enjoy the merrymaking. I'll tell you Merry Christmas. Because I understand that that's the colloquialism for this particular holiday. Now, there's other atheists who have made different decisions about what they will and will not participate in, and that's fine. That's for each individual to do. And there might be reasons for them that they think differently than I do. And I don't particularly care to say that one is better than the other. But what I do see here seems to be an olive branch from Dawkins saying, yeah, I live in a Christian country, and a lot of our heritage a lot of our customs and a lot of our culture is indeed baked into this and it's familiar to me and Richard even at Dawkins some point it's enjoyable but it does not mean he dies. believes gotta, and it does not like, refute everything Christian that he has said, said about the dangers and harms of this ah! Again, he might come out in his own defense and say something completely different I don't pretend to understand exactly what he's saying or thinking but I do know the way that Christians are trying to interpret it and promote it is dead wrong. I mean, come on, he even says point blank, I'm happy for the fact that Christianity is going down in this country. That's a separate thing from the second part, which is if we have to have religion, is the devil we know better than the devil we don't. And I'm using those terms loosely to talk about the difference between Christianity and Islam. So let's see what he says there. Church attendance is plummeting. But the building of mosques across Europe, I think 6,000 are under construction and there are many more, I mean, are being planned. So you regard that as a problem? Do you think oh, that matters? Yes, if I choose Christianity and Islam, I choose Christianity every single time. I mean, it seems to me to be a fundamentally decent religion in a way that I think Islam is not. The way women are treated, I mean, Christianity is not great about that, really. It's had its problems with female vicars and female bishops and things. but. There's an active hostility to women, which is promoted, I think, by the holy books of Islam. I'm not talking about individual Muslims, who, of course, are quite, quite different. But the doctrines of Islam, the Hadith and the, and the Quran, is fundamentally um, hostile to women, hostile to gays. I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of Christian faith. And, and by the way, this conversation, conversation is about Europe. He even turns to her at one point and says, Well, you didn't ask me about, uh, about Christianity in, in America. That's a different matter in time. Okay. Because he recognizes that there's a level of fundamentalism in Christianity that is additionally harmful. And that plays itself out in America very different than it does in Europe. So culturally, being a Christian in Europe is preferable to him over the kind of Islam that is also playing out in Europe. I think most atheists, if given this choice, in Europe between their version of Christianity and their version of rising Islam would say, let's stick with our cultural Christianity. That preference from Richard to me, again, does not equal belief at all. It does not bode well for Christians. It's not saying, oh, they have it right. It's saying in their incorrectness, they, in the way that they practice that currently, is less harmful. That's it. If that's the win that you want from Richard Dawkins, you can have it. 
in certain parts of the globe, certain parts of Christianity, as they are acted out or watered down, are less harmful than other religions that are acted out in a more fundamentalist way in those same regions. That is all that I am hearing being said here. I think to close this out, we just put a nail in the coffin with this idea that Richard Dawkins is now a Christian or is professing that Christianity is true or any of these things with this very simple statement from the end of the interview that I have yet to see played on any of these videos that are making these claims. I don't think it's nonsense. The Christian belief, I mean, today at Easter, and, and of course I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Just one thing. Damn! Damn! Christianity is a minority religion in this country. I think it matters from a cultural point of view. It doesn't get any more simple than that. It's funny because the way that Christians have taken this video and portrayed it seems to me to be very much like how Christians read the Bible. They just cherry-picked it. They took a couple of sound bites where they did not care to understand the context or the nuance, while dismissing the exact sound bites that deny the very thing they're claiming and tried to make something entirely new out of it. The formula is obvious. It's how we have today's Christianity as it stands. They left out the Old Testament part of Richard Dawkins and the vague fuzzy parts of his New Testament they arranged to their liking. How perfectly ironic. So, my thoughts on the matter are pretty simple. I agree. I think that the decline in religion in general is a positive trend. I don't pretend that from a secular standpoint we have everything all figured out and we're ready to be successful without religion for really the first time in history. We do have certain places that are doing this, though, and they're doing it well. So there is a template laid out, but there is going to be a large growing pain process, I believe, when we swap out stories and myths and gods of the gap and personal saviors for reality. I get the appeal of religion. I get the sense of justice will be done in the end. I get the everything will be made right. I get someone cares for me and I was made with purpose. I understand why all of that is attractive. I don't see where any of that is true. And in the byproduct of that non-truth, I see a whole lot of actual harm. And so for me, that's enough to put forward, let's give truth a go. Let's give reality a go. And you know what I don't think will happen? I don't think we'll go through another dark ages. I don't think we'll have our own version of the crusades as we march forward. I don't think there's going to be any inquisition happening. But these death throes of Christianity that rise up and look something like Christian nationalism here in the States, they're pretty darn scary. And though I would take that over the fundamentalist side of Islam does not mean that Christianity is somehow good or true or beneficial. It just means less harmful in certain aspects as it plays out in real time. So again, if that is the win that Christians want to report from what they heard from Dawkins, I'm all for it. But I hope that some of you who are hearing this and seeing this and seeing a little clip here, or a little soundbite there, a little news article there, can take the time to watch the interview for yourself. I'll link it down below. And do a good job of understanding nuance and context and that the entire thing matters. Nuance, 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 nuance. That's it. Just wanted a quick short Thursday video. Thanks for being here. I do hope to have a Sunday video for you out, even though I have news on. I'm no, so all. looking forward to the eclipse. I'm taking my two young children and my wife to see it. I got to see it last time in 2017, and it is something that is spectacular, and I am excited for them. Awe is You're something that we can still have. Beauty is something we can still remark on. I don't have to imbue this with any kind of prophetic meaning. I don't have to see it as a warning for my life that I've been living away from God. It is a natural event that is unique, and that in and of itself is what makes it special. So yes, I'm really looking forward to that. Good I'll be getting never. back God Tuesday, damn. so I don't know if I'll have had a chance to prepare a Tuesday takedown. I imagine that Thursday I still won't have the New Testament ready, but we should be back on track that Sunday moving forward. So watch a video you haven't seen in the meantime to help out the channel on one of those days if an upload doesn't happen. And until then, keep Thank you. I wanted to personally thank all of my top tiers of support. My Iconoclist, Ian, Boris, GBI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rock, and Sean. My humanist heroes, Jared and Chris, and my atheist advocates, Caleb, I'm Monster, so glad you Jeff, fucked Jeff, up and did that. And Todd, as well Stupid as all of bunker. my scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Stupid bucker. Oh, wow. Uh. Hee 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 hee
stupid bitch. Shit. Now fuck... Damn. God damn it. God damn it. I can do that shit too, you stupid bitch. Stupid fucker. that damn pong goodbye you slut come on you slant that whore shit Come on, you slant out whore. You oin, you. You orient, you orient, you orient a prostitute. You orient, you orient a prostitute. You orient a prostitute. You orient, you orient, a, you orient, a, you orient a prostitute. Slap! Shit. Come on, you slant that slut. The fucking pawns. Come on, you slant out whore. Come on, you slant out whore. You oiled, you oiled, you prost, you oiled, you oiled, you oiled, you prostitute. You oiled, you prostitute. God damn it. Get that goddamn knot out of here, you slut. You oi, you oi, you oriental prostitute. Get that goddamn knot out of here, you slut, that slut. Suck the slut. God damn it. Fucking pawns. God fuck it. Man, this this is really starting to fucking piss me off. 
Suck my dick, bitch. You're really starting to fucking piss me off. You are really starting to fucking piss me off. Suck my dick, bitch. STUPID! STUPID! Race! You would not stop me from getting a whore. I fucked his hole! Stupid fucker. Okay, don't, don't rematch me then. Well, you don't. Damn. I stuck my dick up his butt. And twisted. My dick then it migrated up his fucking esophagus. Puking cum. After it puked the stomach full of cum in his gut. And it dropped out of his mouth and... And was hanging out of his mouth. And was hanging out of his mouth. Puking cum. Both my dick and his fucking mouth. Do you get the fucking picture? He was puking cum. And my dick was p still puking cum. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. My slut. You stupid fucker. Suck my slut. God damn it. Oh, now, hell no! We ain't doing that shit. Oh, now, hell no! Then, then he get a, why, had done this, he get a move to not here, and fork my whore, you stupid motherfucker, stupid fucker, stupid, stupid fucker. Well, I can do that shit too, stupid fucker. Come on, you stupid fucker.
God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. I better move that fucking whore back here. Don't even think about it, you slant eyed whore. Stand that whore, stand that whore, stand that whore, stand that whore. She's a whore. She's a whore. Now fuck up and move that whore right here so I can stick my dick in my butt for free. And twist, well. This is looking like cunt. This is looking like this is looking like a busted cunt. So we have to nick this shit in the fucking bud right now. Cunt. You suck my dick, bitch. Now fuck up and move this work right here. Let's swap whores! Fucking dipshit bitch. You gotta lose one of those damn pawns, you slut. God damn it, I just noticed something. God fucking damn it. Ah, uh, oh. God, fuck it. God, fucking damn it. God, fuck it. God, fuck it. God, fucking damn it.
suck my slut. Stupid fucker. Looks like we're gonna be playing pedicates, pedicates all fucking night long with this shit. Yep. Suck my fucking dick, bitch. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Suck my motherfucking slut. Get myself a whore! God damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fuck it. God fuck it. <coughs> God fuck it. <coughs> God fuck it. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my slut. Cuz I think you done fucked up. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my motherfucking dick, bitch. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. Don't even think about it, you slut. Suck my dick, bitch. Stupid!
suck my slut. Now fuck up and take it with your rook. So I can ear that other rook right here, you slut. With spin. <laughs> Stupid! Damn, I'm getting in it. I'm getting in your business! I'm getting in your business! I'm getting into your business badly. I'm facing that ear, your rook. <laughs> I'm facing that. I'm facing that ear. I fucked his hole badly. With the Spister Girl. I Spister Girl. I would Spister Girl him. That one was a lot longer than his. Damn. And he's so butt hurt after losing those two games. He's ass sore. I stuck my dick so deep in his butt that when I was finished, he was so butt hurt, ass sore. He could not walk straight for three whole weeks, nor would we. He could not sit down and play another game of chess because that ring of fire around, around his asshole. No, I got news for the bitch. Nor will he be able to get up and walk for three whole weeks. All he will be able to do, all he will be able to do, is lie in bed and hope his wife will fuck him. That Chinese slut. Oh, it's mine. That Japanese whore, that North Vietnamese whore, that North Korean whore, that North Vietnamese harlot. <laughs> Fucking harlot. Come on, you harlot. Come on, you harlot. Move, harlot. Move, you harlot, or I'll put your black ass for stolen. You harlot. I ought to block his black ass. You see, that pisses me off. That pisses me off. I didn't need even get the fucking credit for his fucking failed game. Fucking bitch. Suck my slut! Welcome to Mindshift Brand. I'm Jay Satin, the Kingdom Come! I've heard people with just bad ideas, bad arguments, and bad apologetics. And that last one is exactly what we have today. We have some bad apologetics coming from Bishop Robert Eckerhart. From Bishop! Robert! Not Bishop, but Bishop! And we're going to break it down line by line. We've had this theme going lately on the channel with the different ways that you can interpret and take the Bible. And what I think this clip exemplifies is the semantic play, the word play, the philosophical play. That, that gets, gets away, away from, from the, text the text itself and allows <laughs> to about, about God. God. We see very, very plainly some, some very incorrect plain things being said here. So, so let's, let's take a look at this. Let's 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 what a dumbass. What a fucking dumbass. What a what a what a fucking dumbass. What a fucking God is not a being. What a fucking dumbass. So the famous answer given to Moses, right? They go so we so I am who I am. Moses, Moses is asking, what, what kind of being are you? He's, He's trying, trying to put God, God in categorical terms. terms. And, 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 and the answer, answer there is so important because that makes all the difference when it comes to understanding religious language. Is is if we follow Moses and his question, we, we will inevitably end, end up in atheism. atheism. Because, because if you think God is a categorical object in the world, eventually you'll say, well, I don't see this object. There's no evidence for it. I can explain the world without it. So that's why the answer of God in Exodus is so powerful because he's saying, Dumb, dumb question, question, wrong, wrong question. question. I'm, I'm not, not a thing in the world, world that you can name. name. I, I am who I am, am which means I'm the 
Prius, Prius that's Augustus language. language. I'm prior, prior to, to thought and, and to language. language. I'm, I'm prior, prior to being. being. I'm, I'm that, that upon which the categorical realm of depends. There's, There's a lot here. here. And, and actually, we're going to spend, spend so, much so much time on the, on the very first, first sentence. So, so stick, stick with me on this one. one. But, but even, even before that, that the Christian YouTuber who put this together titled the video Catholic Bishop Dismantles Atheism. That is just not what happened in this clip whatsoever. What is happening in this clip is a definition issue, a perception or Come on, you cunt! Issue of what, what is God, God. And, and seeing all of the different, the different ways in which people interpret this God, this God the issue that I've come to realize is that they, they want all of them to exist together. together. Is, is God, God this thing, thing that is Come on, you cunt! Time, time prior to existence, prior, prior to language and understanding, and understanding that is being itself, God, and not damn it. being. If that's, if that's the case, case fine, but, but we, we shouldn't, shouldn't be able to see this God's effect on the world, world which, which Christians constantly claim we do. This God, God shouldn't look like anything that has agency or decision or interference in this world, world which, which is how the text works. Come on, cunt! This isn't then someone with whom we have a personal relationship, or you get the other side of that. You get a Father God, who is the Good Shepherd and Good Parent who sacrificed his son for us, that, that we can have an advocate cunt. for our original sin, that we are made in his image, all, all of these other ideas, ideas that, are that are so obviously about a being, not being in itself. itself. And, and we won't even get, get into these two different definitions and problems with them, right? Like, like up here we have this very philosophical, ontological idea about God. What power should God have, etc. And to be honest, I don't care that much about this. This is kind of deism in general. This is kind of where the agnostic part of me is like, yeah, maybe there's something like that. But how disingenuous to try to tie that into Christianity and the claims that are made within Christianity about this second definition, the personal God. And we won't get into today about all the issues with why we wouldn't believe in this personal God, the mutually exclusive claim, the invalidity of the Bible, all the things we cover regularly on the channel, and, and sorry my eyes watering, watering all of a sudden, sudden. But, but the, the issue, issue here is when you try to marry, marry them, them together, together. That's, that's when it all breaks, breaks down. down. Okay, okay, we have this thing that is before time. We have this thing that somehow is special pleading. Kiss that, Rick! Right. He, he is so powerful and sovereign that his will gets done. This is all his plan. But when we mix up with the first time, we get things like divine hiddenness and the problem of evil and suffering. And so the semantic game that the bishop is playing here, where he see a dick in your future. I see a dick. A greater concept of being in your future. I see a dick. when you get to the verse that he's quoting. So I see this in a few parts on the way out of the agenda first. First, I want to talk about that first sentence. Then we're going to look at the context of the verse he's using and why he is absolutely wrong. Then we're going to look at all the verses in the Bible that do show us that this God is the exact opposite of what the bishop is claiming. And then we can address him as his other Come on, you street whore from China! Thinking here it leads to atheism, etc. Just a lot of random statements and assertions that we'll cover pretty quickly at the end. So let's dive in. Again, here's that first clip. We would say that God is not a being but being, being itself. itself. And here, it looks, it looks like he's not even arguing, arguing that this God, God is both. God, God. This God, God in his true nature, as he answers for himself to Moses, Moses is, is that he is being itself. Not a subject, subject not an individual, individual is born not a mind, not an owner of consciousness. consciousness. I, mean, I mean, essentially, this just describes God, God right out, out of existence. existence. And, and some of the issue here is just this. It is that we are using words that, that seem to be open to interpretation themselves. themselves. Thus, Thus, when I said, said it's, it's a semantic issue, issue here, here. Right? right? Like, this, this all sounds really pretty. pretty. This, this is the same thing as when we listen to the bishop's excuse on hell. Like, like, it's a lot of poetic... I'm getting in your business! I'm getting in your business! ultimately ends up just completely, again, sorry for the repeated term, falling flat. But it's almost so vague that it can be hard to argue, and thus his targeted audience people just want to feel a shirt, people that just want to hear from a that double down track of unpersonal or intellect that, that they, they are right, right that, that the God, God they believe in is true, that atheism, atheism cannot, cannot be correct. correct. And, and to, to that, that purpose, this kind of talking is really beneficial, beneficial which, is which is why I find it so important to try to deconstruct. So, so I already alluded, alluded to these, but let's break it down into three quick parts consciousness, intentionality, and agency. Right? If God is just being itself rather than a being, with man, this video is so awkward. What do you want to use here? That we, that we would typically think, think of a being having, having. It, it challenges, challenges the very. 
an absolutely shocking, shocking turn of events. Artists has learned of the first century gospel that will overturn everything scholars think they know about oh, Jesus, shit. showing that he was actually a charlatan exposed by the Roman government for duping the Jewish crowds using sophisticated works of magic. The gospel, set to be published this week by the New York Times, details how Jesus deliberately faked his famous miracles in an effort to seek fame and fortune. How, How did he go from magician for hire to son, son of God? God? And, and was the crucifixion a tragic illusion gone wrong? Join, Join us this week on Misquoting Jesus to find out more. At least I got to dick up one of those fucking homes. Welcome, Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. The only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Sometimes the smallest archaeological discovery can turn the world upside down. This week, we talk about one such discovery and discuss how Jesus, a rural carpenter with a talent for sleight of hand, ended up as the persecuted messiah of a global religion. Before we get into all of that, however, but good morning, how are you? Good morning. Doing fine, thanks. Yep. Just, um... Talking, talking to, to uh, uh, my, my wife, wife Sarah, Sarah about our, our, uh, our arthritis problems. problems. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, good. Uh, I'm currently arthritis free. Josh, Josh as, as I was mentioning, is not. Uh, uh, but no. no. Yeah, yeah, all good. good. Okay. All good. 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 And, and before we get to our, our uh, miles. Revelation. Uh, I, I wanted, wanted to ask how you got into doing public facing scholarship because it's not really. A uh, typical career path, path for, for, academics. for academics. It's not something you're encouraged to do. Oh, no, no, you're, you're discouraged from doing it. <laughs> people don't you know, realize this, but if you, if you write a book for a general audience, that is frowned upon by, 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 the, by, by many people in the academy. academy. And uh, uh, I, I had no, no, I had zero interest in doing it. When I was in graduate school, I was bound and determined not to do anything kind of, you know, popular. I was seriously into studying Greek manuscripts and trying to analyze and classify Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And I imagined my entire career would be doing that. that. My, first My first three, three books, books were uh, books, books dealing, dealing with understanding the Greek manuscript tradition of the New Testament, yeah, and two of them were highly technical, so, so that no, no, no New Testament scholar would have read these books, books except for people who were interested in that particular technicality. What ended, ended up happening is, is that after I wrote my third book, book uh, which, which was an Aztec book, book, the Orthodox, Orthodox Scripture, of Scripture, Oxford University Press, Press, Press convinced me, uh, after, after some, some kind of screaming and shouting on my part, to write a textbook, textbook on the New Testament for undergraduates, which, which I did, and kind of liked it. Bloody and then they told me I should write a book for a general audience on Jesus. I said, no, I don't want to write a book on this. Oh, God, no, I want to write do my scholarship. So I wrote it, anyway. And, okay, that's that. I can get back to my scholarship. Then they wanted to know I said, no, 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 I wanted to. And, and so, so finally, I started realizing I was just, just going to do both. both. Um, in fact, fact, come on, you so my career has been writing uh, uh, scholarly books, which I still do, and um, textbooks for undergraduates, but trade books, books, books for a general audience. And I'm really glad I went that, that way because um, it, it, the, the, the hard thing, the hard thing, thing is doing that and keeping up your scholarship. And, and most, most people, people do one or the other. other. Um, yeah, I was just determined, determined, determined to do both. And so, so that was the hard thing. thing. But I really like it because um, I, like I like communicating ideas with the broader, broader public, public and it just gives me the chance to do it. And so I'm a big advocate of it. Uh, when, 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 when young, young scholars, scholars ask me, you know, when, when like, like, they're, they're coming in graduate school, school, I want to write, write trade books. books. No, no, don't, don't write trade books. First, first write, write a few, write write a few scholarly books, books first, then, then you can write a trade book. Yeah, that's the short of it. That's an excellent, excellent, excellent thing to do. And I've been thinking about the podcasting side of what you do. It's The past few years, I think there have been a lot more, or at least in my experience, a lot more academics going this route or adding this route onto the other uh, branches of work. And it's been very gratifying to see because I've previously heard a lot of stories about uh, early career researchers and, and people pretending and being told absolutely do not do this yeah. Yeah. In, under no circumstances. So seeing established scholars like, like yourself and, and John Taylor from the British Museum, Museum who does uh, Thin End of the Wedge podcast, which is 
a serological, a serological public, public scholarship. scholarship. It's, it's really, it's it's really, really exciting. exciting. I love it. Well, well, I'll tell, tell you, the hard part, part is, is that we're, we're not trained to be able to talk to people who are in our field. And, and so, so we're trained to use jargon and have assumptions and to just, and so just, just, just a regular, regular person who has a PhD in New, New Testament can't, can't explain what, what they, they do to a normal human being. They try, but you see the glaze come over people's eyes and they have no idea what they're talking about. It's not that they're smarter than the other person, it's at all. It's not that at all. It's just that you're trained in a certain way of discourse. And, um, figuring out how to talk to other people, people is, um, you, know, you, you got, got left, left on your own to figure it out. out. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. We, should, we should get to the topic of the day. And in case you haven't guessed, no, Bart has had an academic, academic revelation. revelation. We will make a position proof that, that Jesus was the world's first recorded illusionist. This is a day late, but happy April Fool's. Thank you for the sticky letters. We will still be talking about miracles, though. So, Bart, why do you think it's important for biblical scholars to examine reports of miraculous events in the Gospels and other early Christian writings? Well, you know, well, even though that, that, that little bit of it was a spoof, you know, it, it is the case that some historians have looked at the miracles of Jesus uh, and noted that they are similar to activities that are attributed to magicians uh, in the ancient world. And, and it's, it's important, important to understand that, that, uh, that most, you know, nobody would have any reason, reason to understand really, really but in the ancient world, world when people talked about magic, they weren't, they weren't talking about illusions. They weren't we're talking about what we're talking about when you have, have a, you know, some, some person playing around and out of the hat or you know, song somebody into or whatever your magic, your, your card tricks, tricks you know, which seem impossible that they, you know, have ways of deceiving people. In the ancient world, it wasn't magic, it was not thought to be a form of deception. It was thought to be a way of accessing the uh, superhuman world, and people could do that. And so Jesus actually was accused of being a magician, and there are scholars who claim that Jesus was uh, was a magician. Um, so. So, so you have, have that side, side of things, things. and uh, apart, apart from you know, whether you consider it magic or the power of God, God. The, 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 the big, big issue in the ancient world is which is which. Is which. Like, like, people, people can do these things, but who's empowering them? <laughs> Where are they getting the power, power from? And, and so, so in, in Jesus' case, the miracles in the Gospels play a fundamental feature. I mean, you can't, you can't read the Gospels without miracles. You see the miracles. I mean, it's everywhere. He's born of a virgin. He, he, he is an adult. You know, he heals the sick, and he casts out demons, and he raises the dead, and he controls the climate, and he just he walks on water. And like every page has miracles in it, and in the end, it, it, it ends the Gospel. And the, the biggest, biggest miracle of all is not that Jesus has a near death experience. experience. It's that Jesus actually comes back from the dead and is never to die again. <laughs> That's a miracle. And so, so you can't understand the Gospels if you don't take seriously the fact that they're filled with stories of the miraculous. So we see miracles happening in the Bible prior to Jesus in the Old Testament. When we talk about Miracles today, in, in that, that kind of biblical, biblical sense, what do we actually mean? I got a shit. Well, I think we mean something, something different by miracle than people uh, in antiquity did. In fact, I know we do. <laughs> uh, we we have an understanding of how the world works that is driven by what we would call natural law, and so there are laws of physics. And um, people in the ancient world perfectly understood that the world worked in consistent ways. They, they understood that every morning the, earth, the, the, the sun comes up, and that, uh, that it rains on occasion, and that they, they, you know, they, they knew that they, they knew that you could not take an axe head and throw it on a body of lukewarm water and watch it float. You know, they knew it would sink. They, they understood the consistency of things. But we, uh, uh, since the Enlightenment, have developed, developed scientific laws that uh, are, are laws in the, in the sense, sense that it's not like you have to follow them. It's just they always, always work. Um, if, if I take, take this pen and, uh, and, uh, and drop it, it, if, if I, I let go of it, it's, it's going to drop. drop. It's, it's not going to rise to the ceiling, ceiling and it will never rise to the ceiling. ceiling. And, and there are reasons for that. And so, uh, so, so when you have natural law, laws of thermodynamics, for example, they just, they just are never broken. broken. They just, just aren't. aren't. <laughs> and, and so, so in, in our thinking, thinking if, if we have, have in our thinking, if we have a miracle, it's because, because one of those laws 
have been broken. broken. And, and so, so and it, it requires some, some kind of supernatural intervention for that to happen. In, in, in the, the ancient world, they didn't have that view. view. In, in the, the ancient, ancient world, it seems weird, weird, but in the ancient world, people, people didn't differentiate between our world and, and the supernatural world. world. There wasn't a different realm in the sense that there's a supernatural world. The gods were within our realm. And the, and the God, God of Israel, Israel was within our realm. realm. So, so everything, everything is natural. It's just, just some, some things usually happen, happen and some, some things usually don't happen. happen. The things that don't, don't usually happen, happen if they happen, happen you call that a miracle. miracle. So, so what, what miracles, miracles do we see in the Old Testament, Testament before Jesus, Jesus comes on the scene? Well, you, you see most of the things that Jesus himself does. You have people in the Old Testament who can heal the sick. For example, or who can, can raise, raise the dead. dead. Uh, so so bo both, both Elijah and Enoch, for example, raise, raise, raise the dead, dead as, 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 as Jesus does, does and, and can heal, heal the sick. sick. Um, who, they, don't they don't cast out demons in the Old Testament, Testament because the idea of demons is a later development, development within the Judaism. Um, um, but, but People, people do have power over nature. Over nature. Moses uh, you know, splits, splits the waters, waters of the sea of reeds, and the children of Israel walk over dry land. land. Moses, Moses does, does a bunch of miracles. miracles. Only people do a bunch of miracles. These are understood to be acts of God. Um, but, you know, the sun coming up every morning is an act of God. It raining when you, you know, when you need rain and it rains, that's, that's an act of God. And so, and so in their mind, it raining, technically, or the sun coming, coming up, up, technically, is much, much different from healing uh, a person's leprosy, or raising something from the dead, or splitting the waters of the dead sea. It's the same kind of thing. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a different one of these things, things but it's, it's, it's how God is acting among us. So, so for Jesus as a holy man, man would it have been surprising to people that he was performing reportedly these miracles? No, no, I mean, if, if you, you if you think, think of Jesus, Jesus as a particularly uh, endowed representative of God, God like the prophets, prophets in the Old Testament, Testament for example, or like Moses, well, they, well, they did, did miracles, and so, and so it would be more or less expected that Jesus could do miracles, miracles if he's empowered, empowered by God. God. But, but it's, it's not only in the Old Testament. Testament. It's, it's also throughout, throughout the Greek and Roman world. We have the stories of people who are like Jesus, miraculously born, and because they their parents are divine, or because they have special divine, divine power, power they, they too do do, do miracles, miracles. Uh, they, they can, can control, control the weather you know they, they can, can they can heal the sick and raise the dead and they can do you know they can do things that are very similar to what jesus jesus himself is said to have done and just, that was the popular view is that these kinds of things can happen and the question is who's doing them and who's empowering them to do them and so, and so even, even in, like like in, in the Christian, Christian tradition, tradition later, in the, the Apocryphal Acts of the Apostles, Apostles, so you get accounts of the Acts of Peter, the Acts of Paul, the Acts of Thomas, you often have these miracle contests between the true representative of God and the false representative of God. And so the, in the Acts of Peter, you have Simon Magus, who does all of these things, who can, who can, uh, who can do amazing miracles, but he's empowered by the bad side. <laughs> Peter's empowered by the good side. And so there was no there, there weren't, weren't debates, debates about whether, whether miracles happen. happen. Man, there, there were debates, debates about what it means and who's, who's providing man, the power. The, the miracle contest that always put in mind of the, the, the movie Prince of Egypt, Egypt God, uh, God, when uh, uh, Joseph is around us. Damn it. Well, well miracle, miracle contest with the, the priests of, of Egypt. Egypt. Um, damn it. Are there any miracles, miracles that are like, like specific to just Jesus, Jesus or is, is his like miraculous repertoire very much in line with everything else we see from the ancient world? world? Uh, uh, that's, that's a good question. question. I mean, I think most of the most of the stories about Jesus doing miracles are, uh, are fairly, fairly readily, readily replicated in other sources for other, for other, for other people. people. There, there are always differences. differences. So, so that the differences tend to be in detail rather than in the overall scope. scope. To, to begin, begin with, when Jesus is born of a virgin, virgin. Um, in, in Luke's gospel, gospel Jesus is born of a virgin because the Spirit gets Mary pregnant. I guess that's true in Matthew, Matthew as well. well. And, and so, so Jesus, in a sense, is, is literally the Son, the Son of God, God because... because 
God is the one who gets the woman pregnant, not a human. And so God's the father and the mortal is the mother. And you certainly get that in Greek and Roman traditions for other figures of divine births, union of a mortal and an immortal, the birth of Alexander the Great. Uh, for, for example, example or, or Babylonians of Tiana, for, for example. example. But the, the difference is, in these other, other accounts, accounts in the Greek and Roman world, world, the woman's, woman's not, not a virgin. virgin. And, and so, so there's, there's a, a twist, twist because in the, the Christian, Christian account, uh, she's, she's a virgin. virgin. She's, she's never had, had sex with a man. man. In the other, she, she has had, had sex with a man. But, but in both cases, cases, she's made pregnant with this person by a god. And so there's a difference, but there's also similarity. And there's a difference. The thing is, so I do this exercise with my students. I have my students read all these miracles about Jesus and the Gospel of Luke, Epic Luke. And then I have them read all the miracles about other people in other Greek and Roman sources. And, uh, uh, and, and so, so you know, in order, order to see, see how, you know, you know, the similarities and differences. And what, what they always say is, is yeah, okay, you got these miracle workers doing this, you know, Jesus, Jesus is different because of this or because of that, because of this other thing. But I point out to them that you're absolutely right, Jesus is different. But if you take any one of these others, and, and put, put them, them over against, against the others, others and, and include Jesus among the others. Now, fuck up, well, this person is different because they're not Jesus. It's not that Jesus, right. Jesus is the only one that's different. So they're all different. So but they also have so lots of things in common. Do we see in the canonical here. Gospels, do we see differences between the kinds of miracles that they report, or are the writers using the same material? The miracles in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are many of the same miracles, and there are many of the same of the same kind that are different stories a lot of the miracle stories are almost formulaic uh what i mean by that is you can kind of set them up so there's like a sequence of action that happens but the specifics vary every time and so somebody is you know deathly ill or has a demon inside or you know who has died uh somebody a relative or a friend comes to jesus and asks for help Jesus agrees, Jesus goes to the person, Jesus speaks a word or touches the person, the person is healed or the demons cast out and the person is dead, and the crowds all marvel. So it's like boom, 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 it's the same sequence. But you have different, you know, you have differences within. And in the synoptic gospels, a lot of the miracles are set up in that kind of sequence. Um, and a lot of the stories are actually the same story with with varying details from one gospel to the other. Uh, the Gospel of John is Pretty much like that. There are far fewer God miracles in John. There are only seven miracles in John. They're not called miracles. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these things that Jesus does are called, uh, they're dunamis. So that's where we get dynamite from. And it means a powerful act. And so uh, Jesus does a powerful act. And so the idea is not Come that on, it's a violation slut. of natural law. It's a, it's a powerful act. When you, get to, uh, when you get to John, they're not called powerful acts. Dunamis. Dunamo, they're called uh, signs. They're signs. Never called miracles. Never called powerful acts. Why are, they, why are they called signs? Because in the Gospel of John, the point of these these things that Jesus does seven times is that they show they are signs of who Jesus is. They are meant to show that who he is, who he says he is. And so he says that he is the bread of life. And after that, he multiplies the loaves of bread to feed people. He says that he is, that he is the resurrection of the life. And so he raises somebody from the dead. He says that he's the light of the world. And so he, he restores somebody to sight from blindness. And so in, in John, these are all signs. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're all powerful acts. John doesn't call them powerful acts. And the God, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't, not only don't call them signs of who Jesus is, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is asked to do a sign, and he refuses to do a sign. So he considers, in fact, doing signs a satanic temptation in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in the Gospel of John, that's all he does is signs. <laughs> and so that's an interesting difference. Uh, but the, the and so John does have several that's miracles not, that are common with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But, but of, some of the biggies, core, like the raising of Lazarus from the dead, that's only in John. Or the favorite miracle on every college campus in America, changing water to wine <laughs> at a party. <laughs> that, that's only in John. And so John has its unique things and only has seven of them. Do we have additional or different miracles 
from non-canonical writings. Well, yeah, you, we, we do. I mean, it depends what your non-canonical writing. But you know, some of the some of the most interesting um, stories about Jesus outside the New Testament involve him as a child. <laughs> and so there's this one of the favorite gospels. Yeah, you slut. Like the non-canonical gospels is called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And uh, in that gospel, Jesus does things like he's uh, early on, he's a five year old and he's making these uh, these uh, sparrows out of mud. He makes these 12 sparrows. And but uh, a Jewish man sees him doing is angry because it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. And the man goes and complains to Joseph, Jesus father, that he's like, uh, you know, he's working on the Sabbath. And Joseph comes and is really upset because you're not supposed to break the Sabbath. He tells Jesus, why are you making these sparrows? What? And and Jesus Jesus uh, looks at his father, looks at these sparrows, claps his hands and says, be gone. And the sparrows come to life and fly off chirping. And so it's a great miracle because Jesus, he, he, you know, he, sparrows, what sparrows? I don't see any sparrows. So he, 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 like, he destroys all evidence of malfeasance, but he, you know, he makes these animals to come to life. So Jesus doesn't make any animals come to life in the Gospels, and he's not doing anything out of mischief in the Gospels. And so, so yeah. So depending on what kind of gospel is, there are there are things outside the New Testament with Jesus doing spectacular acts that are not quite like what you find in the New Testament. If we think about. Uh, the occurrence of miracles in Greco-Roman literature and in um, Christian literature, New Testament, non-canonicals, do we see them in the same literary genre or is this a phenomenon that kind of crosses boundaries? So in the New Testament, most of the miracles are reported in narratives, as you would expect. And that's also true of what you get in uh, Greek and Roman and Jewish sources. There, there are almost always stories about somebody who's understood to be uh, superior to the rest I of the humans you, too, because of some what? kind of divine power. Uh, and so you get that in, um, you certainly get it in Greek and Roman circles, in Greek and Roman mythology, but also in uh, Greek and Roman uh, historical texts. Um, so, for example, the Roman Emperor Vespasian, uh, toward, uh, after Jesus' death, um, was uh, reputed to have done miracles. But it shows that his something about his superiority to the rest of his humans, that he can make somebody see where he can heal the lame. Um, and so these are almost always in narratives. No, you, you also what? do get discussions of miracles in non-narratives. Um, you certainly get this in in, uh, in Christian texts with um, authors talking about miracles without narrating them. A famous instance of that is the Apostle Paul, who claims in a couple of his letters uh, that when he was uh, when he was present with people, so Second Corinthians, he says that when he, I was with you, that he did uh, signs and wonders and miracles. And so he's he's not telling a story; he's reminding them of something that they've seen, which makes historians just say, "Wow, I, we really wish we knew what he was talking about." What 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 does he mean? And uh, we we don't know. So, it, but it happens in, in Greek and Roman circles too, where people will talk about miracles without narrating them. What purpose do miracles serve in ancient literature, and do we see them serving a different purpose in early Christian writings? I would say that uh, generally, um, when somebody does something spectacular that is seen to be something more than a human can do, it's in order to demonstrate the divine power within them and or the power of a particular supernatural being, a, a, a you know, superhuman being. And so in uh, Greek circles, for example, Apollo uh, is understood to be the, the god of healing. And so you can have a shrine to Apollo where people, these are not stories, people actually go to a shrine of Apollo or a shrine of Zeus um, or uh, some other god for healing. And these are historical situations where people claim that they get healed there. And so one of the most interesting things about some uh, healing shrines from the Greek and Roman worlds is they had, um, when people would be healed of something, they would put up an image of their body part on the wall that would be made out of metal 
or out of clay. God and so you go, you would go to these shrines and you'd see, uh, see eyes and ears and breasts, women's breasts and penises and you, like models of these things on the wall and with you people thanking the God for healing them. And so healing uh, miracles uh, and, and, you know, nature miracles, making it rain when you have drought and things were always, almost always interpreted as showing the power God, of God for the gods, because the gods were able to do these things for us when we, we have no way, you know, if we, we've lost our hearing, there's nothing we can do, especially in the ancient world, but God can restore your hearing. Uh, a particular God could. And so within the Christian tradition, I'd say they function the same way. They function to show that God is powerful and that if you worship him, he will use his power to help you. And in the Christian tradition, one added bonus that's rather significant is that God's miraculous power is demonstrated not only here, but also after you die. And so in the afterlife, God's power will be everywhere. And if you're on his side, you will bask in it. And if you're against it, you're going to suffer from it. <laughs> and so this became a, a missionary tool for Christians who argued that their God was far more superior than every other God. Well, how do you prove that? How do you show that your God's more powerful than the other gods? Your God does better miracles. And Christians... Christians repeated this God over and over and over again for centuries to convert the empire up to Augustine in the fifth century. Augustine says people complain about not being miracles anymore. He says, I've seen a ton of them. And he starts listing all of these healing miracles that he's seen that are really quite amazing. And, and he says it just shows that God, our God, is more powerful than any of the others. And um, so it was used as a missionary tool. If we focus on Jesus for a second, is this identity of him as a miracle worker something that was imposed on him after his death? Or does it seem as if this was happening while he was still alive? So uh, I have a minority opinion on this one uh, among scholars. Scholars, most scholars, probably with most lay people, um, let me clarify this. Most lay people and, and many conservative Christian scholars would say, well, it was during his lifetime because he actually did those things. Um, but suppose if you suppose you hold in abeyance the question, you know, did Jesus really walk on the water? Um, did Jesus, you know, really raise Jairus' daughter from the dead? If you're not a Christian, you'd say no. But you do have these stories. And even if you're a Christian, I mean, I, I know a lot of Christian scholars say, well, no, actually, it didn't actually happen. <laughs> you know, it's trying to make a point. But whether you think a miracle happened or not, did the miracle working materials arise during his lifetime? So people who believe in miracles would say yes. People who don't believe in miracles would be split. Some would, most would say yes. Jesus had the reputation of being a miracle worker during his lifetime. And they have very, very strong arguments for that because it is so widely attested among our traditions that he was doing miracles. And even if they weren't happening, it looks like everybody thought he was doing miracles. Uh, and that's not the same thing. Um, you know, it, you can you can certainly say that Oral Roberts was believed to have done miracles during his lifetime. But skeptics would say, well, he wasn't really doing miracles. <laughs> you know, like people were deceived or people thought it happened or there's propaganda. You know, there have other you know, or other miracle workers today. But you could say it happened during his lifetime. With Jesus, I think there's some genuine doubt about what I think. It's a minority view. I think there's genuine doubt about whether the miracle tradition was floating around about Jesus during his lifetime. I don't know. I do think that once the disciples believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. They understood that he had experienced the greatest miracle that ever happened, and that began to endow him with miraculous powers, and that they started telling stories about him doing miracles. So the resurrection didn't come as a surprise. It came as a climax. So I don't know. It is interesting to me that the earliest understanding of miracles with respect to Jesus appear to be that Jesus was doing miracles to show that the kingdom of God was soon to come. The logic of this is that in the kingdom, nobody's going to be sick. So Jesus heals the sick. There won't be any demons. So Jesus casts out demons. There won't be any death. Jesus raises the dead. So Jesus Jesus is, is being shown to... Uh, portray his message almost through a par through enacted parables by, by doing these things. Was that going on during his lifetime? 
you know, I don't think there's any way to know for sure. I doubt it. But um, I would say most scholars think, yeah, it probably was. So if we're looking then at different reports of miracles, why are they so common in <clears throat> religious traditions? And are there, are there compelling reasons or any reasons for thinking that Jesus did miracles, but that Apollonius of Tyana didn't, or Simon Magus or Muhammad? Only Jesus does the real miracles. Yeah, well, I guess, yeah, those are those are related questions. Why particularly within religious traditions? Let me start by saying that it's very difficult. People might have trouble getting their minds around this, but it's very difficult to define what religion is. Uh, in major universities throughout this country, uh, there will be classes, uh, Introduction to Religious Studies, that spend virtually the entire semester trying to come up with a definition of religion. <laughs> and you think it'd be easy, right? It is not easy. What do you mean by that? And their entire books written on like, what do we mean by this? And so I, so I say that as a preface <laughs> because I need to talk about like what religion is. <laughs> if nothing else, for most people, that's how you that's how you cover yourself you say for most people <laughs> religion is a recognition that there's a realm beyond us and that it that provide can help provide significance to our lives and our world uh, and in the ancient world I'd say that that's absolutely the case in ancient religions is that there that that there are forces greater than ourselves that are work in this world and in ancient religion the goal was to figure out how to be on the right side of these forces so that they could ha they could assist us in this horrible world we live in how do we how do we get by i mean how can we possibly survive and we're just these these peon bodies in this uncaring world and so the gods can provide things for humans that can allow us to survive and to and to thrive hopefully and so um the miracles are meant to show how the gods are doing that. And in most most religious traditions, they're, they're meant to celebrate what the gods can do so that people will worship the gods. And that's certainly the case in early Christianity. If you see that the God of Jesus is, is more powerful than any of the other gods, you will worship the God of Jesus. And you know the goal is to get people on the side of truth and miracles lead people to the truth. And so, uh, if you look at it from a historical point of view, like if you're bracketing what you personally believe or what you personally don't believe, and you look at the miracles done by Apollonius of Tiana, um, uh, a miracle worker living at the end of the first century, who would have been born around the time Jesus died, uh, who also got in trouble with the authorities and who was also uh, put on trial and was also said to have um, been raised up to heaven after his death. Very a lot of similarities to Jesus. Is there any reason for thinking that his miracles didn't happen if you think Jesus' miracles did happen? My view is that if you think Jesus' miracles happened or Apollonius' miracles happened or anybody else's miracles happened, that it's a step of faith. Um, it's not based on historical evidence. There's no, you can't, you can't mount evidence for people breaking laws of physics. I mean, you can say that people said they saw it, but it doesn't, you know, I mean, unless you have some way of explaining how a law of physics is broken, like it just doesn't, it never happens. <laughs> and so, uh, so if you think it does happen, it's a leap of faith. It's not based on kind of what, what you know, based on how we know everything else. So, uh, the same principles apply to Apollonius of Tiana that apply to Jesus. And so, when you have Christian apologists say, oh no, we have all these accounts of Jesus doing miracles, and so since you have all these accounts, it probably happened. Well, we have accounts of, you know, other people's miracles happening. But they wouldn't say, well, they actually did those miracles then. Well, if they wouldn't say it for them, why would they say it for Jesus? It's because it's, it's a matter of faith. So, I don't think... I, um, I personally think if you're going to apply criteria to say that Jesus' miracles did happen, you need to apply the same criteria to Muhammad and to uh, people of heretical Christian groups that you don't agree with and to other religions. And to, you, know, you just apply it across the board, and it turns out you know, lots of people are doing these things. Do you think it's possible to be a Christian if you also doubt that, le that Jesus did some or all of his miracles. Maybe he wasn't born a virgin, he didn't walk on water, he didn't raise Lazarus from the dead. I do, yeah, because I know I know people who are very um, devout Christians 
who don't believe in the literal truth of those stories, that they actually happened. Uh, and so empirically speaking, it is possible to be a Christian and not believe those things. I say it's empirical because there are Christians who don't believe those things. And if you say, well, they're not a Christian then, well, okay, that's your theology. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, so their theology is that they are a Christian. And by that, they mean they mean that there are some aspects of the life and death of Jesus that are uh, are important for them, for understanding and accepting for them to be followers of Christ. Um, many of these people would say that, you know, they can't prove that Jesus died for their sins, but they do think that Jesus is the way Jesus is the way to God. They think that following Jesus uh, provides them with salvation. Uh, some of these people don't believe in an afterlife. Some of my friends who hold this view, they don't know if there's an afterlife. They hope there is, but they don't know. But they think if there is, that, that if they are a follower of Jesus, that, that God will protect them in the afterlife. I think it is possible to be a Christian without these things because Christianity is not a belief in Jesus walking on the water. It's a belief that Jesus somehow shows you the way to God. Traditionally, Christians have said that the death and resurrection of Jesus are what put a person in a right standing before God. That, well, Jesus could die and be raised from the dead without raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. Maybe that miracle didn't happen, but he could still die and rise from the dead. And so I think you know, like picking every miracle and saying it had to happen, had to happen the way it's said, otherwise you can't be a Christian. I think, you know, you can think that if you want, but you're just making stuff up uh, because there are Christians who, who think otherwise. Thank you very much, Bart. We are going to end there. We'll take a brief ad break and we'll be right back. Have you ever wondered where the New Testament Gospels really came from? Were the books actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as everyone seems to say? The answers to these questions may surprise you. In fact, what you discover may challenge everything you thought you knew about the Gospels. If you're ready to learn the historical truth, then you won't want to miss Bart Ehrman's free webinar, Did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John Actually Write Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? In this 50-minute talk with Q&A, you'll learn answers to some of the most intriguing questions surrounding the Gospel's authorship, such as, why did early Christians say the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John if they're anonymous? What's the best evidence that the Gospels were written by the Apostles? Were the Apostles of Jesus educated well enough to write books? And last, if the Apostles did not write the Gospels, who did? And where did they get their information? Don't miss your chance to uncover the truth behind the Gospels. Sign up now for free lifetime access to Did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John Actually Write Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? at bartherman.com forward slash authors. Thank you. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. So, Bart, given that we've spent today talking about miracles and the resurrection, obviously is pretty big miracle. I wanted to point people to the resurrection debate that you and Mike Lacona had. It was a few years ago now, and I moderated it. I think that was maybe our second or third professional interaction. Uh, if people are interested, it's over at bartermancom forward slash debates. You can use the MJ podcast code for a discount. It was a whole seven hours. Um, how do you feel that went? <laughs> I have no recollection. I was so exhausted. <laughs> seven hours. What were we thinking? <laughs> it was. It was a seven-hour debate, and um, so you it was struggling to fill the time. Either there was a no, lot. No, no, we could have kept going. So, so Mike, uh, Mike Lacona is a friend of mine who is an evangelical Christian apologist. He firmly believes um, in traditional Christianity. And he tries to convince people to become Christians. So he's also an evangelist of sorts. Um, and among other things, he believes that he can prove on historical grounds that Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, the debate was not about whether Jesus was raised from the dead. The debate was about whether historians can prove it using historical criteria or whether it's, it includes or whether it's strictly a matter of faith or whether it has to at least include a matter of faith as opposed to history. 
And so that was our debate. I very strongly feel and have felt for a very long time that that even if you say the resurrection happened, you can't prove it historically using the kind of criteria that historians use to establish what probably happened in the past. I, I had that view, by the way, when I was still a Christian. When I was still a Christian, I, I believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, but I knew you can't prove it in the way that you could prove other things from the past. Uh, Mike thinks you can. And so that, that, was our, uh, that was our debate. And the thing is, it gets you into a lot of stuff. I mean, it isn't just, yes, you can. No, you can't. It's not that kind of thing. It's like, you have to talk about how do you establish what happens in the past? And, um, you know, what is eyewitness testimony? worthwhile. Do we have eyewitness testimony for Jesus' resurrection? If we do, does that mean it probably happened? Do eyewitnesses get things wrong? Are they reliable? Um, do eyewitnesses see things that didn't happen? So that's just eyewitness. To, I mean, you have these gospels. You have to talk about the gospel accounts. Are they accurate or not? How come they're con inconsistent with each other? Are they inconsistent with each other? So there, there are like a thousand topics on this thing. We, He and I had debated this before in public, um, but like regular debates. <laughs> we thought, let's let's just go for it and uh, actually have a full debate. So that's what we did. It's, it is seven hours. And, uh, and so people, yeah, people can still get it. People are still getting it and it's yeah there it is <laughs> did, did, can historians prove the resurrection i remember a being surprised when i was asked to do it at how long you were planning on on discussing this question for i, I thought to myself there is no way no way they can fill seven hours and then you did and yeah. like you said could have kept going very easily but yeah. the the breadth of of information that was covered was really really fascinating Absolutely yeah. fascinating. I, I really enjoyed it. I was very tired afterwards, and I'm sure that you and Mike were even more exhausted than I was. Well, I'm still exhausted by it. But the, you know, <laughs> the thing is, you know, when you have these debates, every time I have one of these debates, um, both people who are involved in the debate come out of their thinking, oh, man, I creamed that guy. <laughs> Yep. Yep. And it's just weird. I hear people like on Mike's side say, oh, man, sorry, you did so badly. What? You, oh, man, I destroyed you. And Mike said, oh, man, I destroyed you. It's like that kind of thing. So he, but the thing is, that's that's the nice thing about a debate. Um, and the thing, the thing that I wish people would do with the debate is not just come in with your mind made up about which side you agree with, but listen to arguments. For me, that's the most important thing, to listen to the arguments. And so, yeah, there are a lot of arguments in that debate, and people can listen and see what they think. Absolutely. That is com forward slash debate, if that sounds interesting. It is interesting, so, yeah, highly recommend it. Uh, and our bonus segment this week is a new one. It is called Bart's Books, and Bart is going to share a book recommendation. Seeking to expand your knowledge of biblical studies? In this segment, Bart shares influential works shaping biblical scholarship. It's time for Bart's Books. He's trying to get as Uzi what Orson. book are you recommending to us today? Well, you know, we've talked a lot in here about the historical Jesus, uh, and we'll continue to do so because it's virtually an inexhaustible topic. Um, when I was in graduate school, I had a professor who didn't want us just to read the most current stuff, but who realized that the classic stuff is really classical for a reason. And one of the major classics in the study of the historical Jesus is Albert Schweitzer's book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus. Um, and it is justifiably a classic. And if anybody's interested in how scholars since the Enlightenment have understood who Jesus really was, based on the fact that we have Gospels that are disagree with each other and have mistakes in them. How do they go about reconstructing Jesus? Schweitzer covers every major scholar who talked about it from the 1770s up to his own day in 1906. And it's still kind of a bedrock foundational book for anybody interested in this topic about how you know what Jesus said and did. Schweitzer gives his own answer to this at the end of the book. Uh, it's a witty book and it's very clever. And he's so smart. Um, but it's, it is, it's one of the brilliant books uh, in the field of New Testament studies. So that, that's what I would recommend for anybody who wants to kind of get down there and see how it's actually happened historically. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, before we finish for the week, would you mind just summarizing what we talked about? 
Yeah, well, we were talking about the miracle tradition uh, uh, of, of the Gospels with Jesus uh, doing miracles and wondering uh, how do they relate to other miracle traditions in Greek, Greek and Roman circles especially, and how do these miracles function in the Gospels? What, what are they there for? And is there anything we can say about them historically? I mean, can we say that Jesus was a miracle worker? Can we say that he was reputed to be a miracle worker during, during his lifetime? And uh, if so, how were these, how, what, what was the point of this, this miracle tradition within early Christianity? Thank you so much. Audience, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartlemon.com. Yes, that includes the resurrection debate. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. But what are we talking about next time? Well, you know, um, next time we're talking about a, kind of a fundamental understanding of what it means to be human. Uh, today, the majority of people think that being human means having a body and a soul. And um, most people think when you die, your soul lives on. And that's that's a common sense among many people. It's like they don't even, there's no question about it. Of course, that's how it is. And that's what everybody's ever, always thought. And it turns out it's not what everybody's thought. And it's very hard to find that thought in the Bible. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about what, what, what the ancient Christian view and the ancient biblical view of the soul was. Excellent. Thank you all. And goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. So please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app, or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us. Ma'am? Hey. Hey, Paul? No.
God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. God damn pawns. God damn it. God damn it. Movie. Goddamn motherfucker. Damn it. Spit, 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 spit. Spit, 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 spit. So I'm a move and you're a, I, I got a dick of your butt. <laughs> I fucked his hole!